Good morning from Beijing and welcome to our special coverage of the President Xi Jinping's trip to the United States. I'm Li Dunying in Beijing. Now, President Xi and his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden have uh, just ended their bilateral talks in San Francisco. They agreed to reduce tensions in China-U.S. ties by further promoting dialogue and cooperation in different areas of their relationship. And the Chinese president is also attending a reception in his honor today and we'll bring you updates of the event in this special coverage. So stay tuned with us. Well, President Xi Jinping has uh, proposed uh, five pillars to ease uh, strained relations, uh, restore trust and respect and push cooperation between China and the U.S. for the good of the world. And she made the remarks during a summit on Wednesday with U.S. President Joe Biden in San Francisco, California. And Lu Wei tells us more. President Xi Jinping and his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden met for a summit during Xi's first trip to the United States in six years. It was their first meeting in a year since they last met on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Bali. In opening remarks, President Xi underscored his long-standing view that cooperation between the world's two largest economies will benefit both their peoples and the rest of the world. President Xi said the world is big enough for the two countries to succeed. My view is consistent, which is that major country competition is not a prevailing trend of current times and cannot solve the problems facing China and the United States or the world at large. Planet Earth is big enough for the two countries to succeed, and one country's success is an opportunity for the other. President Xi made it clear that China does not have a plan to unseat the United States. But the Chinese president said the U.S. should not scheme to suppress and contain China. During their talks, President Xi said that despite differences in culture and social systems, mutual benefit could pave the way for more promising relations. It is an objective fact that China and the United States are different in history, culture, social system and development path. However, as long as we respect each other, coexist in peace and pursue win-win cooperation, we will be fully capable of rising above differences and find the right way for the two major countries to get along with each other. I firmly believe in the promising future of the bilateral relationship. The Chinese president proposed building together five pillars for better bilateral ties. First, developing a right perception of each other so the two countries can coexist in mutual respect and peace. Second, managing disagreements and untoward incidents effectively through calm, frequent communication. Third, advancing mutually beneficial cooperation, not just in traditional areas like trade, but in emerging and urgent issues such as climate change and artificial intelligence. Fourth, shouldering responsibilities as major countries by stepping up coordination and cooperation on international and regional issues. Fifth, promoting people-to-people -people exchanges. President Xi Jinping also reaffirmed China's position on the Taiwan question. On trade, he urged the U.S. to take China's concerns seriously and lift its unilateral sanctions on Chinese economic entities. For his part, President Biden said it was important Understand to keep the two countries' competition in check and called for joint efforts to tackle common challenges. We have to ensure that competition does not veer into conflict. And we also have to manage it responsibly, that competition. That's what the United States wants and what we intend to do. We also, I also believe that's what the world wants for both of us, candid exchange. We also have a responsibility to our people and the work in the world uh, to work together when we see it in our interest to do so. The U.S. president said, a stable and developing China serves the interests of the U.S. and the world. President Biden reaffirmed his own five points. The U.S. does not seek a new Cold War or to change the Chinese system. It does not seek to strengthen alliances against China. The U.S. does not support Taiwan independence and has no intention of conflict with China. The two presidents agreed to promote dialogue and cooperation on emerging issues such as artificial intelligence and to resume high-level military-to-military communication on the basis of equality and respect. Thank you. Thank you. They also agreed to increase passenger flights
between the US and China by early next year, and to expand exchanges in various sectors. And now our reporter Mark New and Dan Williams are joining us from uh, Palo Alto and San Francisco. Uh, I will go to you first, Mark. What were the key messages from President Xi and President uh, Biden's meeting? Tony, well, I'm here in Silicon Valley, which is just a short drive away from Filoli Estate, the place where it all happened, um, that historic California uh, landmark uh, with 265 hectares of land, 65 hectares of gardens, and 56 rooms, provided a beautiful setting for the two leaders to sit down across from each other for the first time in about a year. Now, uh, President Xi's opening remarks contained perhaps uh, this most memorable line, uh, planet Earth is big enough for the two countries to succeed, and one country's success is an opportunity for the other. That certainly strikes a tone, conveying a sense of partnership as opposed to rivalry. Now, President Xi Jinping pointed out that the China-U.S. relationship has never been smooth sailing over the past 50 years or so, and that it always faces problems one way or another, yet it has kept moving forward amid twists and turns. He said turning their backs on each other was simply not an option. Now, he underscored his belief uh, that major country competition is not the prevailing trend of current times and can it solve the problems facing China, the United States, or the world at large. Uh, she expressed his firm belief in what he called a promising future of this bilateral relationship. The two leaders had a discussion that lasted several hours. In a press conference after that, U.S. President Joe Biden said they needed to ensure that competition did not veer into conflict. He also said that the two governments had agreed to resume high-level military to military, military communication. And he touched on another area of agreement. And the topic or where there is common ground, artificial intelligence, the hot topic these days. Biden says he and she uh, affirm the need to address the risk of advanced AI systems and improve the technology safety through joint government talks. So important discussions happening that could have big implications down the road. Dong Ning. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mark New, reporting from the Silicon Valley. And now let's turn to our reporter Dan Williams. He's at the International Media Center of APEC 2023. Dan, hello there. Well, President Xi attends a welcoming dinner for him. What do you have for us on that? Yes, this uh, is one of the hottest tickets, as you can imagine, in town with some of the top uh, business leaders and CEOs uh, attending this dinner where the uh, China president, uh, Xi Jinping, is expected to deliver a speech as well. We know that uh, Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, uh, is among those to attend this. And we've also seen uh, Terry Branstad there as well. Now, Terry Branstad is the former Iowa governor. He's also the former U.S. ambassador uh, for, uh, to China as well. Uh, serving during the Trump administration. And uh, it's uh, once again uh, this uh, old friend story of Iowa, isn't it? Um, uh, the likes of Sarah Landy, who is also uh, going to be in attendance of this dinner, we understand. She's the Iowa Sister States program uh, leader back then. It all comes back to this dinner, this uh, event in 1985, where uh, Xi Jinping, then a county level official, visited Iowa uh, back then. Uh, he met with the likes of Terry Branstead uh, then as well. And of course, a lot of people didn't realize the uh, significance of this visit uh, at the time. And it uh, was Xi Jinping, then the vice president of China in 2011, that reminded Terry Branstead of his time in Iowa. It was a very, uh, uh, obviously, an impactful time where he ate popcorn, uh, watched movies with an American family. He stayed with an American family during that visit. Uh, and he reminded Terry Branstead of that visit at that time uh, and went back in 2012 to Iowa uh, to once again see his old friends. And we understand that those many of those old friends uh, from those visits will be uh, in attendance at this uh, gathering, as I say, mainly of business leaders, uh, but also of his old friends there as well from the uh, U.S. state of Iowa. That event taking place uh, right now here in San Francisco. It's always nice to meet some old friends and always meeting the new as well. Thank you very much, Dan Williams, reporting from San Francisco. And now for further insight, uh, we're 
I'm joined in the studio by Mr. Zhao Hai, Director of the International Political Studies at the National Institute for Global Strategy of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And also in Shanghai, we have uh, Professor Joseph Gregory Mahoney uh, of Politics and International Relations at the East China Normal University. Gentlemen, welcome to our special coverage. Well, first of all, I'll go to Mr. Zhao. As we just said, the re reception and dinner honoring Chinese President Xi Jinping is being he uh, held in San Francisco. It's going to kick off very soon. How do you understand the purpose of this dinner? What is the underlying intent here of holding this dinner? Well, I think San Francisco wanted to show their hospitality to pre uh, uh, President Xi Jinping uh, because considering the last time President Xi set foot on U.S. oil uh, is uh, almost six years ago uh, to Mar-a-Lago, and this time in California, I think Californians wanted to show that they have better uh, treatment towards uh, President Xi and wanted to show him the uh, good environment uh, that is conducive to this high-level meeting uh, that is held in the city. Right. Uh, apparently, San Francisco indeed uh, gives a great sincerity to this meeting and to welcome uh, President Xi Jinping and also other leaders of uh, the APEC members. Uh, then, um, Professor Mahoney, what do you think that this dinner will actually bring to the U.S.? Well, I think in terms of uh, his his dinner with the business uh, leaders, uh, it will bring uh, direct uh, personal communication and, and reassurance uh, from President Xi himself that China is open for business, that China welcomes uh, U.S. businesses and uh, U.S. investment and U.S. products, uh, that the Chinese market is opening further, uh, that we saw new policies being put in place during the recent uh, import expo in Shanghai. Uh, that we're already seeing major new contracts uh, coming uh, from China for American agricultural products, and that Beijing is now listening uh, uh, and, and uh, ready uh, to respond uh, more aggressively to uh, investigate concerns like ensuring uh, a level playing field as well as uh, technology transfer-related problems. Right, and President Xi will also deliver a speech at the welcoming dinner. Uh, so, Professor, what's your expectations from his speech? Well, you know, some experts have been advising uh, President Xi to address uh, the American people to, uh, directly, to, to personally explain the Chinese position and Beijing's ambitions. Uh, but for various reasons, this is unlikely uh, to happen in so much as this might be interpreted as trying to meddle in America's internal affairs. Uh, nevertheless, it is possible and very reasonable to speak directly to business leaders. Uh, this happens regularly anyway with uh, key American business leaders visiting Beijing, uh, as we've seen many times this year already. So my, my first expectation is that this is obviously an opportunity to communicate uh, positive messages and perhaps policy breakthroughs uh, with U.S. businesses, uh, to speak of opportunities and even spark uh, their competitive desires to expand in the Chinese market, and to realize that this could be good news for these businesses and the U.S. economy, and likewise something positive that would need to be accommodated in some way by Washington, uh, particularly if these business leaders lobby the White House and Congress to support more trade and investment and less restrictions. Mm -hmm. So what is the big, biggest problem in U.S. Congress about trading with China? Well, the biggest problem in the U.S. Congress is that the, 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 the trade relationship, but, but more broadly, the, the entire bilateral relationship has been incredibly uh, uh, politicized. Uh, and we have this intense uh, polarization in the U.S. Congress, and uh, which is itself a reflection of the intense uh, political polarization uh, throughout the United States, as well as broad-based concerns that the U.S. is experiencing some sort of decline and that uh, China in some way is, is uh, uh, the, the beneficiary of America's decline. So in this context, uh, people feel insecure. They feel like China's a threat uh, because they, they are unhappy with uh, the way things are being handled at home and they're externalizing these fears and anxieties. So that's not gonna change in the near term. Things aren't gonna magically get better for the US economy. Uh, the debt problem isn't going to simply go away. Neither is uh, politicization or polarization. And in fact, we're very worried that these issues might consent, uh, continue to get worse uh, out throughout 2024 uh, with the uh, upcoming presidential campaign. And indeed, this is one of the reasons why this meeting at APEC was so critical because we expect the challenges to, to become uh, perhaps more severe and we need to try to get ahead of them in some way. Mm 
Mm -hmm. We need to get prepared and also be a little bit patient. Uh, we'll continue our discussions, gentlemen, later on. And joining me now are my colleagues uh, Anna Naidu and uh, Jim Spellman in our San Francisco studio for some observations about this event. Hello, gentlemen there. What do you have for us? Thanks, Li Dongning. Right now, the United States-China Business Council and the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations are hosting a dinner for Chinese President Xi. The dinner, very exclusive dinner, will include business leaders and politicians. And the goal of that dinner is to boost investment by U.S. firms in China. Our correspondent, Jim Spellman, is with me. Uh, Jim, that dinner comes at a little bit of a price, doesn't it? Uh, it does, but this is the hot ticket yeah. uh, uh, during APEC for anybody in the tech industry. An opportunity to have dinner with Chinese President Xi Jinping to make your pitch for your company, try to find some opportunities. There are no small names uh, in this uh, industry, Jim, either. I mean, there's Tim Cook of Apple. He's the CEO. He's there. The former U.S. ambassador to China, Terry Brandstad's there as well. And, and they're going to hear a speech at some point tonight from Chinese President uh, Xi Jinping as well. So this is really um, it's going to be a crucial evening, I think, perhaps as important as some of the things happening over at the CEO Summit. That's the part of this um, APEC gathering where business leaders and world leaders get to come together and mingle. Right. So this is really the nuts and bolts of this kind of visit, isn't it, where you have business leaders making their pitch to the president of China, who's... Uh, who's right there. Um, what are expectations on the speech that he will be making? Uh, that, that's being really closely guarded, so, mm -hmm. so we don't know. But I th we think that we're going to hear an expression from the president that China is open for business, that there are opportunities here. And, and that's an important message. Uh, the the U.S.-China Business Council, one of the groups that's putting this on, they surveyed member organizations who say that geopolitics is the biggest thing stopping American firms from investing in China. And 34 percent of businesses have stopped or slowed their business in China because of fears over that. We're talking about uh, U.S. restrictions on Chinese tech companies, um, internal Chinese policies that can make it difficult to do business there. So these leaders see a huge market that they want to be involved in, but they see obstacles to getting there on many fronts. So they, what they want to hear uh, are, are practical ways that those obstacles are being yeah. removed. But we did hear during the recent uh, Chinese import expo uh, which took place in Shanghai, I think, where Chinese leaders made it clear, look, China, as you point out, is now open for business. They're going to re lift these kinds of restrictions, the kind of red tape that was involved before. What are the types of uh, investments that China is looking for? Well, uh, when you're talking about that kind of foreign investment, I think from China's point of view, they're looking for uh, things that are adding value. So that would be anything in the um, in the space of renewable energy, anything in the space of sustainability, uh, so climate solutions, things like that, where you can really kind of leverage uh, know-how from the United States, from Europe, with uh, needs. And you're seeing uh, this agreement that came out yesterday, climate agreement between the two countries. You're seeing opportunities there. The business world is seeing opportunities there. At the CEO summit, we heard people discussing that. Okay, if these two countries are together on fighting climate change, then there are private industry solutions that we can get involved in and public-private investment as well. They see China as a huge market mm -hmm. for dealing with those types of uh, sectors. You know, politically in the United States, there's one fundamental difference between China and the United States, whereas, you know, the United States sees, and President Biden has said this on many occasions, sees China as a competitor. Mm -hmm. China doesn't see it that way. It says, look, this, to use the words of the president, the space for both of us on planet Earth right now, both of us to uh, emerge winners in this. You know, we, we can be um, of benefit to each other. Um, I mean, what are the roadblocks to American investment right now that you think would have to be removed? Uh, I think the, the, the biggest one is simply fear. Fear that if this relationship were to get worse, more tense, that, uh, that some sort of investment that they've made would be eliminated, that they wouldn't be able to see it to fruition. When you're talking about investing millions or even billions of dollars in projects like that, you want certainty that the geopolitics around it are not going to overshadow the business uh, opportunities. Right. You were telling us a moment ago, some of these big names, big tech names at the dinner, um, I mean, did any of them talk about the kind of products that they would sell to China? Sure, absolutely. I mean, everything, everything, as we were discussing 
from uh, people who want to sell scallops, you know, <laughs> scallops in China, to to huge companies like Microsoft who would like to be involved in AI ventures right, right out of the gate. Uh, I, we ran across Gavin Newsom, the the governor of California, and he was checking out a new electric airplane from Boeing. And Boeing is a company, of course, that loves selling airplanes to China and anyone else, and uh, and they would love to be able to sell new electric airplanes. They would love to be able to leverage this sustainability yeah. efforts and, and get there. Gavin Newsom told us that these two countries are not going to get divorced, yeah. right? They are going to be together. They have to work together. And, you know, it, the, it used to be a kind of a, a conventional wisdom in Washington that trade leads to peace. But it feels like over the last, you know, through, through the Trump administration and into the Biden administration, that trade has become weaponized. You know, and so I think that a lot of these business leaders would like to see detente on that. They would like to see the weaponization of trade be eliminated and, and once again, you know, become a, 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 a vehicle for peace, but let's not kid ourselves, they want to make money, right? right, right. And they see that possibility for, for trade in, with China. And the kind of sentiments that have been expressed by Gavin Newsom, very different from that coming out of Washington, isn't it? I mean, he's been talking about win-win solutions, etc. He was in China recently. Mm -hmm. He was there on quite a lengthy visit. Yeah, and, I, I, you know, one of the problems, I would say, in the United States with changing, stabilizing the relationship with China is whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, there's really no space to be pro-China right now. Uh, it, 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 you're going to have a tough time getting reelected in the House, in the Senate, and in the White House if you are seen as being pro-China. I don't think that that's going to get turned around anytime soon. We're on this every two-year election cycle here in the United States between, with the House, the Senate, and the White House, and I don't think that's going to change. And uh, we got a readout from the White House, you know, where where that was brought up as a yeah. topic. There's only so much that we can do here in the United States because of the political reality. So that is definitely an obstacle to all, all of the stuff that we've been discussing. There are goals that both sides have and that the business community has. Yeah, you know, Jim, we're talking about the details here of what this visit is about, but uh, earlier, uh, President Xi made some remarks before the formal a uh, meeting with President Biden started in which he was very expansive in his talking about this relationship. He says, look, you know, we need to get relations back on track. It's important not just for the two countries, not just for the two peoples, but for the world, for history, he said. Uh, so uh, we're seeing something of a pivotal moment, aren't we? I, I, I think so. And if you really start at the personal level, uh, President Xi Jinping talked about old friends, his time with, with Joe Biden going back more than a decade. Mm -hmm. And tonight at this dinner, amongst all these business leaders and CEOs, are friends that Xi Jinping made in Iowa when he was in his early 30s and he came here and visited. The first stop on that trip was here in San Francisco. He later went to Muscatine, Iowa, and he still considers those people old friends, old enough and good enough friends to have them here. He says that to me, you are America, the friends he met in Iowa. I think if you can start at that level, the people to people level, and, and kind of rebuild the relationship through that, right. there's opportunities there. And even though you or I are probably not likely to get invited to a dinner with Tim Cook and Xi Jinping, but that's still that personal connection that could happen at a dinner like this. Okay, Jim, thanks a lot. Lots more gonna be happening in the hours and days ahead. Thanks uh, for being with us. That's it from us here in San Francisco. Back to you in Beijing. Thank you very much, Nigel. A very fantastic discussion there in San Francisco. And uh, our reporter Zhao Yunfei is joining us also from San Francisco near the venue of the banquet for President Xi. So Yunfei, you are the closest one in our team to the venue. What more can you tell us? Fair enough. Very, very close. In fact, the uh, reception dinner ordering President Xi Jinping is right upstairs. I believe it's ongoing because the guests have already entered the venue. Um, and now, uh, tonight, hopefully, President Xi is about to uh, deliver a speech. And uh, among the participations, uh, my colleague has covered that there are, are people covering a range of, coming from a range of fields, but uh, uh, in general, they have one thing in common, which is they have made a, a certain degree of contribution uh, to the relationship between China and the United States. For example, there are business leaders, elites. Uh, we just uh, saw Tim Cook. Uh, we tried to approach him, and, but Tim 
uh, Cook didn't uh, respond to our interview. Uh, but uh, certainly we, t we do talk to several people. For example, um, uh, we talked to the uh, former U.S. ambassador to China, Terry Branstad, and uh, he uh, said that it's important that the competition should be um, uh, constructive. And he was the governor who was hosting President Xi back in the 1980s. Um, certainly, so as my colleagues mentioned, that uh, these are the guests uh, among participants are some are to some degree old friends of President Xi because uh, they either uh, have writing letters as, or uh, you know have some interactions uh, with the Chinese president. Another person we spoke with is the mayor of St. Lucum, Washington, uh, Dick Murray, and uh, he told us that uh, as two major uh, economies, uh, China and the United States, uh, it's it's important for the two countries to like know and love each other. So that's one uh, important point between the two countries. Now, uh, in the morning when President Xi met with President Biden, uh, he mentioned that um, the global economy is recovering after the COVID pandemic, uh, but uh, there are momentum that remain sluggish, and uh, that's why uh, the two countries should you know, work together uh, to pave the way towards common good and major country competition, he said, is not the prevailing trend of current times. So uh, that was the meeting, you know, official meeting in the morning, but I guess the reception and dinner would be more leaning towards the people to people uh, exchanges. And he will certainly uh, take this opportunity to celebrate the friendship uh, as well as carry on the friendship to the further developments of the ties between the two countries. Back to you. Right. It would be a perfect uh, venue and chance for China to send out the invitation for foreign investors and also for the U.S. entrepreneurs to think how and when to come back to China. And uh, that was Zhao Yunfei, our reporter, reporting from San Francisco, just near the venue. And now let's continue our discussions with... Uh, with our two guests and uh, first I want to uh, turn to Mr. Zhao in our studio. Well, as we can see uh, in the bigger picture, actually uh, the venue has been set up with uh, the touch of blue, the color blue. A color blue in China is uh, considered as a color bright but with a little bit of caution. Do you think that is also the color for China-US relations, especially trade relations? Yeah, I think that blue signifies the blue ocean. And uh, President Xi has said that earlier that the, uh, the world is big enough and also the ocean is big enough for both China and U.S. to co peacefully coexist. And each other's success is actually providing more opportunities for the other side to open up more space for development. So I just want to say a couple of points. Uh, I think American side... Uh, ex expecting President Xi to say that uh, China is open for business, uh, welcoming American investment, uh, that's certainly true. But there are two other points uh, that I want to make, and probably President Xi also want to emphasize. One is that uh, China is, um, of course, committed continuously to reform and opening up. But China now has a tar has a purpose, which is uh, the Chinese. Uh, style of modernization and to pursue a high quality of econo economic development, mm -hmm. meaning that China also wanted to climb up the uh, uh, value chain and create more valuable jobs right. within China. And secondly, do, they, do those two conflict with each other or can integrate with each other? I think they're mutually supporting uh, with each other. It's not uh, that the competition will bring a vicious circle that the two countries will have a bad outcome. However, I think the healthy competition actually create more space, more jobs for both countries. Mm -hmm. And the second point uh, is that uh, uh, the uh, president will emphasize that de-risking uh, from the U.S. side is not the right policy going forward because, of course, it's different from decoupling. However, de-risking from the U.S. containing the meaning to de-risk from China, which is uh, fundamentally wrong because from Chinese perspective, de-risking means that the, corp uh, that the corporations, business communities need to work together to prevent risks from global challenges like climate change, like a possible pandemic and disruption to supply chain, not from geopolitical risks from each other. And that's, I think, a, a problem that uh, the two leaders and also the two countries need to work out a solution. Uh, and I think moving forward, uh, particularly starting from this uh, very successful summit, business leaders will see that uh, 
uh, the uh, future will get brighter and the opportunity for investment in both countries will gradually coming back. However, that depends upon uh, the U.S. government uh, realizing uh, China's true strategic intentions, uh, eradicating those misperceptions uh, or misunderstandings and change their policy directions. Right. And um, Professor Mahoney, what do you think of uh, U.S. Uh, and China relations um, especially after the message is given out from the summit meeting between the two leaders. You just said that uh, uh, the messages or the achievements of the summit meeting will not be implemented immediately after the San Francisco uh, meeting. But uh, what are the biggest obstacles in place between bilateral trade and can they be removed after the meeting? Well, let's be clear. I think we can see uh, relations post APEC taking uh, one of two possible paths. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, the, the dark side, which is the U.S. returns to aggressive talk, policymaking, and other behaviors uh, that we've seen over the past six years, uh, particularly if the U.S. remains committed, uh, despite uh, its assurances, uh, to advancing a new Cold War paradigm or something like it. And uh, uh, particularly as the U.S. presidential campaign and upcoming elections in Taiwan, uh, risk further politicization of uh, China-U.S. relations. On the other uh, hand, uh, this could be, you know, the, the threshold for establishing uh, a new normal. Um, uh, and, and even if we're moving in, in some strange way towards a Cold War, you know, the United States did have to work uh, with uh, the USSR previously to manage um, uh, big issues and, and global concerns. Uh, but I don't think we necessarily have to look at it in such a negative way. Perhaps uh, Washington has now put in place, for the moment at least, uh, what it considers to be a sufficient number of assets and restrictions that will help it feel more secure. Uh, and with these uh, differences better delineated and managed, uh, this could create uh, an opening, uh, one like we're seeing here at APEC, uh, for focusing on more common uh, ground, including uh, areas where the two countries uh, must work together to solve crises, uh, but also opening the door to uh, better trade relations and uh, cultural exchanges. Right. And there were already some uh, positive uh, signs being sent out before this meeting. For instance, for the first time, the U.S. sent an official delegation to China International Import Expo CIE in Shanghai earlier this month. They set up an official pavilion to uh, uh, to promote is a good food and agricultural products. So, Professor Zhao, would you say this is a positive turn given the strained China-U.S. ties in recent, uh, especially economic ties in recent years? Well, certainly, because this uh, import expo uh, in China is very important, and the U.S. being part of it, uh, showing the U.S. is more willing to uh, join the Chinese market and expand in the Chinese market. Uh, the good sign is that, uh, of course, the agricultural pro uh, products are welcomed in China. The U.S. produced a large amount of soybeans, uh, corn, and, and beef, and other products that China needs. And China also has a big appetite for those products. Mm -hmm. In those areas, there's no uh, major conflict, actually, uh, each other accommodating and accepting uh, each other's uh, uh, products and markets. However, the negative side of this is that, actually, there are more products that are needed in China, like high-tech products. Mm -hmm. Without restrictions, the U.S. companies could more actively participating in the import expo uh, and export more to China. So I think uh, uh, overall, this is a good start. However, hopefully next year, there will be more technology companies and more you know, other companies um, uh, throughout the, all the spectrum that will come to this expo and increase export of U.S. products to China. We hope to see that indeed. And business leaders in the U.S. Uh, are going to dine with Chinese leaders tonight. And actually, several months ago, a number of U.S. CEOs already met officials in China. So, Professor Mahoney, how do you view such interactions? Are, are you seeing more interactions like this happening in the future? Uh, you know, I see these interactions as, as being extremely positive, and perhaps even more positive than the, the high-level official visits uh, that we saw uh, that came after uh, the, the Bali meeting last year with, 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 uh, with Lincoln and other uh, cabinet officials coming to Beijing, with the possible exception of Janet Yellen's visit, I think that was very, very positive, and, and, and she's promised more to come, and, and we should be optimistic about, by, about that. But, you know, I think real outcomes are, are driven by, by real policies and real uh, relations and by a real desire to work and advance together. Uh, policymaking itself can be influenced by positive relations. And this is this is true everywhere, not just in China. 
Now, China does emphasize people-to-people -people exchange in part because China understands that actually meeting each other and having a clear and mutual understanding is the foundation for working together in productive ways. Uh, when Bill Gates uh, uh, came to Beijing this year, uh, I think he sent a clear signal to others that the door is open, uh, that China welcomes and listens and works cooperatively when possible. Uh, when Tim Cook and Elon Musk came this year, they were uh, reinforcing and, and advancing existing positive relations uh, and more than likely uh, 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 building uh, benefits uh, for their companies. So this is the trend. And I think that uh, everyone who's at this meeting in, in uh, San Francisco uh, wants to be part of that as well. Yeah, we just hope to see that both countries uh, are on the same page, at least, and going to the same direction. Uh, we'll continue our discussion, gentlemen, uh, later in the show. Now, a senior Chinese uh, trade official says that business communities from both China and U.S. hope for stronger bilateral ties. And Ren Hongbin, chairman of the China Council for the Promotion of International Trade, told CGTN that he expects more U.S. investment in China. There is a strong desire between Chinese and American business communities to strengthen beneficial cooperation. We can feel this during our work. The Chinese market has maintained a strong attraction for U.S.-founded enterprises. China has continuously optimized its business environment in recent years by gradually relaxing market access and building high-level open platforms such as free trade pilot zones and the Hainan Free Trade Port. We have also ranked second in the world in attracting foreign investment for five consecutive years. In the first eight months of this year, China's actual use of U.S. capital reached 1.98 billion U.S. dollars, a year-on-year -year increase of 18.6%. By the end of August, the United States had invested in more than 78,000 projects in China with an actual investment of 96.85 billion U.S. dollars. Over 70,000 U.S.-founded companies have invested in China with their annual profits reaching 50 billion U.S. dollars. Since the beginning of this year, our China Council for the Promotion of International Trade has welcomed nearly 100 executives from multinational companies visiting China including Elon Musk from Tesla, Tim Cook from Apple, as well as heads of a large number of American companies such as Intel and Qualcomm. During our conversation, we also realized that these American executives are full of confidence in China's economic development. They also expressed that they will lead U.S. companies to continue to deeply explore the Chinese market and expand investment in China. And lately, the U.S. Food and Agriculture Pavilion made its debut with 17 exhibitors at the 6th China International Import Expo. Over $500 million worth of deals were signed there, showing good sign of agriculture cooperation between the two countries since the trade war. China is a market of great potential. Currently, it's our largest export market for U.S. ag products, but we think it could grow even more. Uh, so we think that by encouraging interaction between officials and businesses on both sides, this will help remove barriers to trade, improve efficiencies, create greater knowledge of the products that are available, and this will promote sales. And it's in our interest because it's a good thing for our economy. They also help China. It provides good products at low prices. So it's really a win-win situation that we want to promote. And our two countries have already benefited from them, and they should continue to. And now let's continue our discussions with two gentlemen. One is here in, uh, in our studio and one is in Shanghai, Professor Mahoney and Professor Zhao. Uh, Professor Zhao, well, China and U.S. both say they do not want decoupling, uh, although U.S. actually changed to another wording, de-risking. Uh, that assurance was given when Chinese Vice Premier He Lifeng held the talks with the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen last week. Uh, what do you make of that? What do you make of uh, not decoupling? Well, I think uh, Janet Yellen, the, sec uh, the uh, Secretary uh, of the United States, uh, repeatedly said that decoupling is not an option because the decoupling will bring economic disaster, a catastrophe. Uh, and the Chinese side holds the same view uh, that because the intricate and very complex uh, interconnected and interdependent global supply chain already established and there's a huge amount of trade 
between China and U.S. Cutting off that trade and decouple the two uh, biggest economies in the world is just unthinkable. So I think uh, drawing to that conclusion is very natural for both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is that now that the uh, U.S. is following the European Union and adopted this new concept of de-risking, the problem is how do you de-risk uh, the two uh, you know, largest economies and to what extent do you want it to de-risk? Mm -hmm. And also there's this new concept called a small yard high fence mm -hmm. where the U.S. wants to, to limit its technology uh, uh, sort of transfer to, to China. Mm -hmm. So that's another problematic area because business are also very unclear about the parameter of that fence and how high that fence is. Mm -hmm. So moving forward, it, I, I think it's very important to clarify the U.S. intentions and policies and make sure that everybody understands where the limits are and how can we uh, have more communications uh, circumventing those uh, limits. And I, I think uh, it's very clear, both sides understood, that the growing economy, that I mean the two economy will continue to grow and Chinese mm -hmm. economy will continue to grow at a higher uh, speed. So right. the market is still here. The question is only that how do you uh, invest in this market and continue to share the benefit uh, for this growing uh, market. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese side has made it very clear and uh, in the past uh, year or so, there are multiple policies coming out to open the doors uh, wider. And uh, as stated previously, that we have more uh, free trade zones experimenting more policies. So in the future years, uh, people should expect that the Chinese market will open up more and welcoming more foreign investment and foreign business. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, if the U.S. continue to curb its own investment in China, it will only give the opportunities to other countries, and particularly European and Japanese and Korean companies. And then the U.S. will try to prevent those companies companies from investing in China, mm -hmm. that will actually bring uh, down the whole world economy. So mm -hmm. I think the rational choice for both countries to work together, iron out the problems, you know, curb and manage this, this geopolitical competition mm -hmm. and give the business community uncertainty mm -hmm. uh, for the next decade. It's not easy to iron out anything, especially the problems between the two biggest economies. But Professor Mahoney, can you, is it possible for you to answer any of uh, Professor Zhao's questions such as uh, de-risking? Uh, how and to what, to what extent is the de-risking will happen? Well, you know, I agree with a, a lot of what uh, Professor John was saying earlier about de-risking, uh, and, and I would simply add a, a couple of points to, to reinforce some of the points that, that he was uh, implying, which is, you know, in a world where we have increasing risks uh, associated with um, uh, climate change, with uh, the possibility of uh, uh, friction spilling over into war, and in fact, war is already happening in, in theaters in, in Gaza in Ukraine and others threatening. Uh, we have to we have to take a very different perspective on risk. Uh, uh, instead of uh, allowing uh, this culture of uh, securitization or hypersecuritization uh, uh, infect everything, uh, and therefore uh, lead us to uh, become hyper de-risking in a way that actually accomplishes, in one form or another. Uh, substantial decoupling. This is a problem. Uh, it's also a problem uh, because, uh, you know, as, as Professor Zhao said earlier, you know, it used to be that uh, there was this idea in the West that the, that the more that they traded with China, the more China would change. And indeed, China did change. It's just that China didn't change the way the West necessarily expected. But that said, there's another point that uh, Professor Zhao was making that I, that I can amplify a, a little bit differently, which is, you know, it's not just that Korean companies or Japanese companies will come in and invest. They may or may not. But the fact of the matter is that we will see China solving problems like advanced chips. If the U.S. doesn't want to sell them, if other countries don't want to sell them, if other countries don't want to invest, we'll see leading Chinese tech firms solving that problem. And then we'll see China being tech independent. And that will be even more threatening to the U.S. position. In other words, not only will their companies not be able to sell their products, not only will the trade imbalance or the lack of trade really be dragging down their own economies, China simply won't need them anymore. And that will create a, a bigger danger and even more risk and even uh, further concerns like de-risking down the line. Mm -hmm. Do you agree, Professor Zhao, about uh, the high-tech uh, high tech section, that China will actually be self-sufficient in the future and uh, de-risking won't work? 
Well, I think uh, China's policy is very clear that uh, in the key technology area where the U.S. is intended uh, to put a bottleneck on China's development, uh, will ha have to be self-sufficient because there's no other support. Uh, like the um, but, being, but being self-sufficient does not mean that we rely on, dependent on ourselves completely. Absolutely. And don't borrow the force. Uh, from the outside. Exactly. I, I think these uh, kind of uh, interconnectedness and interdependency will not go away. Just like uh, uh, some people are saying that we're in age of deglobalization, but some people also argue that we're in the age of reglobalization, meaning that supply chains are reconnecting uh, through different ways, and also uh, technology cooperation is happening uh, from uh, you know using different space. So I think it's unrealistic to cut off all the cooperations and to produce every single piece of technology in one country. That's exactly, essentially, that is geopolitical thinking. Uh, and that's what we need to overcome, meaning that we need to uh, you know, really extend our trading and uh, technology cooperation across the globe to uh, really realize efficiency and promote economic uh, growth. Otherwise, if everybody is satisfying uh, everybody's own needs mm -hmm. using industrial policy, mm -hmm. and the outcome is very clear, it's going to be low efficiency, slower economic growth, mm -hmm. slower technology development, and ultimately it's going to be a lose-lose situation for everybody. Indeed. Well, this just came in. The Chinese President Xi Jinping has uh, just arrived for dinner in his honor with top U.S. business uh, leaders. So so the dinner has uh, kicked off, Professor, uh, two professors actually, gentlemen. Uh, so let's continue to talk about uh, the business and trade relations between the two biggest economies. And uh, according to U.S. data, trading goods between U.S. and China hit a record 600 and 90 billion US dollars in 2022 and that's despite US tariffs and also export controls in China. So what characteristics do you think the current bilateral trade relations have and also uh, it would have, well, would, would it be very different in the near future? Uh, Professor Zhao. Well, um, I think uh, first of all that shows one word, resilience. And the bilateral trade is very resilient throughout the pandemic years, throughout the trade war. Uh, and overall, it's continued to grow. Uh, so far, there are signs that uh, China-U.S. trade, um, I mean, Chinese proportion of export uh, of U.S. import is actually decreasing. Canada and Mexico is increasing to top one and two. However, uh, Chinese products are still in many other products uh, going into the United States through uh, like Vietnam or India or Mexico or the other countries. So that shows the supply chain is very resilient and Chinese uh, uh, position on the supply chain is consol uh, consolidated because of technology development and, by, uh, and because of Chinese uh, efficiency. So overall, I think uh, in the future, uh, people need to figure out exactly how to position their supply chains. And uh, uh, after the pandemic and also uh, after the stabilization of China-U.S. relations, there are still many space to improve e efficiency and uh, regain some of the economic benefit uh, of trade between the two countries. Uh, in the next decade, I think there are still many barriers ahead. Uh, like we've mentioned previously, that in the U.S. Congress, people are advocating to uh, actually cancel the PNTR between the two countries or threatening to cut more ties between the two countries, particularly on digital trade and the future service trade. And that is the direction we're moving. Uh, using more AI and using more uh, technology uh, mm. like Internet, uh, 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 Internet of Things. Mm. So I think it's very important that two sides sit together. And the good sign, of course, is that mm. two sides uh, are establishing AI talks uh, between governments and also uh, other areas of more communication. So by solving some of those problems, hopefully, uh, I mean, to, the both sides will lower the suspicion of each other and mm. help to uh, smooth uh, the future direction of trade well, to increase more service trade uh, between the two sides. Well, Professor Mahoney, uh, what kind of uh, impact or how big impact to this, uh, this kind of high level exchanges between the two national leaders and also exchanges uh, on various levels afterwards have on US Congress on deciding trade issues with China? You know, I think uh, Congress remains a loose cannon. I think we have a, a new Speaker of the House who who uh, is from the, uh, the more right-wing uh, uh, part of his his party. Um, um, he's someone who emphasizes uh, faith and religion. 
in his policy making. We, we heard this very explicitly when he was promoting um, uh, the, the, the aid for uh, Israel's um, actions in Gaza, so forth and so on. We know that he's not taken a very positive position uh, towards China in the past. Uh, we can expect, I think, uh, uh, politicization in Congress to continue. Uh, even even the Democrats, of course, uh, in the Senate, although Chuck Schumer came to Beijing, uh, he's long been a China hawk. So I don't think we can expect much of a respite in Congress. We should we should expect that to, to go forward. But I would like to, to respond in part to the to the question that you asked uh, uh, Professor Zhao about the 2022 numbers. Uh, and it, that was indeed uh, an exceptional year. And I think we point to it uh, often as, as evidence uh, that U.S. restrictions uh, have been failing uh, to lead uh, to substantial decoupling. Uh, and we've countenanced this with uh, uh, reassurance uh, from the U.S. that decoupling is not the objective. Uh, nevertheless, I, I think we have to uh, avoid uh, fetishizing uh, the 2022 numbers because there's uh, already data this year that the trade numbers have declined. Now, perhaps last year's numbers were driven by factors related to pandemic recoveries. Perhaps it was the last hurrah where businesses were getting the most out of trading relations because they were not uh, uh, confident in, in the future. Or perhaps they robbed uh, this year with, with uh, to some extent, with, with more trade last. It's hard to say. And I agree with Professor Zhao that some of this trade is now being road, uh, routed through third countries uh, to avoid some of these uh, sanctions or tariffs or other uh, restrictions like Vietnam, that, that China's uh, industrial uh, system, uh, manufacturing system, is the most advanced in the world. And you simply can't uh, uh, get supply chains very far away from it. Uh, but I think that uh, this, this realization that, uh, that these policies are starting to bite and are likely to bite is driving uh, uh, China to, to um, uh, take a more assertive position in, in appealing uh, to American business leaders as we're seeing today. And I think it's also uh, inspiring American business leaders who are seeing opportunities slip away because of Washington's policies uh, to come and meet President Xi, whether in Beijing or in Shanghai, and try to rectify this relation and to uh, continue to grow rich together. All right. So thank you, gentlemen. We'll continue our discussions later on in the show. Uh, you're now watching our special coverage on President uh, Xi Jinping's trip to San Francisco in the U.S. We'll be right back after this. From sustainability and digitalization to trade, health and energy security, 21 major Asian Pacific economies gather to address the most pressing global challenges and to create a future of sustainable economic growth. Join CGTN for our coverage of APEC 2023. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. Watching our special coverage on President Xi Jinping's trip to the United States. And for more on bilateral relations between China and the U.S., let's head over to my colleague Elaine Reyes in Washington, D.C. Hello there, Elaine. Great to see you, Dong Ning. Um, your re reaction has been pouring in, as you can imagine, following this meeting between Presidents Xi Jinping and Joe Biden. And for more on that, let's turn to Sean Caleb's inner Washington newsroom. And Sean, these leaders spoke for hours and really covered a lot of ground. There was a lot of consensus, but still a lot to bridge. And for China, the issue of Taiwan was at the very top. Yeah, exactly, Elaine. If you think about it, a year since these two leaders last spoke, it was a time where miscommunication uh, could have uh, grown wider, perhaps uh, built up some kind of chasm there. So it was a chance for these two leaders to sit down and talk face to face about issues that are very important to each other as well as their respective countries. And you're exactly right. President Xi Jinping making it clear that uh, Taiwan is, in his words, the most important, most sensitive issue for uh, China as well as for the President Xi. And it has been a year since they discussed the China 
uh, Taiwan relationship and President Xi Jinping making it clear that he would like the U.S. to take real action and honor its commitment that really came out of the Bali talks when Joe Biden and the U.S. government said that it would, it does and always and has recognized the one China policy. Uh, he uh, also said this is a time for the U.S. not to support Taiwan independence and stop arming Taiwan. Specifically, uh, the United States has been selling uh, weapons and arms to Taiwan, uh, and Taiwan has also boosted its defenses recently, including uh, building submarines. Uh, President Xi sending that China will realize the unification of Taiwan, and that, in his words, Elaine, is unstoppable. And Sean, despite months of preparations, there wasn't a whole lot of expectation going into this major face-to-face. -face. Uh, and both leaders, though, detailed how they would like to see relations move forward. Yeah, I think that's one thing that, that, that really needs to be pointed out. Both sides say they basically want the same thing, but it's a matter of how uh, they arrive at this point. Uh, President Xi Jinping really spelling out five ways to, to bridge the differences between the United States and China. I'll quickly break them down. One is developing the right perspective. Uh, just a chance for more communication, a chance for to build up this respect and coexist in peace moving forward. Secondly, a chance to jointly manage disagreements. And that obviously goes back to that if they don't talk, then these disagreements, then this uh, communication has a chance to build over time and become an ultimate divider. Uh, mutually beneficial cooperation. That's something that we did see already coming out of this. They talked about how the two nations want to work together to combat climate change and they want to combat the growing uh, epidemic of fentanyl abuse in the United States and that is uh, very important. Also at this APEC meeting they said that they would like to both find a way to counter uh, narcotics distribution. And also some major problems in the world. Uh, of course, the conflicts going on, Israel and Hamas, as well as the ongoing fighting in Ukraine. The uh, President Xi Jinping saying if the two countries don't work together, then the effort to solve these problems just becomes uh, that much more difficult. And finally, the last one, people-to-people -people relations. And this is something we have heard from President Xi for really uh, the better part of, of a decade. And to put this in perspective, I had a chance, Elaine, to go through some numbers. Tourism, for example. Before 2017, some 3 million Chinese tourists came to the United States. Last year, that number was only about 260,000. So that is a huge uh, drop. And that, of course, uh, it, it, uh, does away with a chance for uh, U.S. tourist dollars uh, to be brought in uh, here as well. And also the number of Chinese students studying in the United States and vice versa. That has also plunged dramatically since 2017. So perhaps if these two sides do find a way to knock off the frost, there will be a way to move forward with more of these people-to-people -people exchanges. And hey, the day is not over yet. As we speak, a big <laughs> dinner banquet happening at APEC, and the guest of honor is, of course, Chinese President Xi Jinping. Yeah, you know, I'm really fascinated with the media coverage of this here in the United States. Virtually every headline or every uh, lead paragraph says this is the hottest ticket to get in the San Francisco area during the APEC uh, meeting. If you think about uh, the business leaders that are going to be there, uh, Microsoft, we know Elon Musk is going to be there, uh, members of Apple's leadership are going to be there as well. And the, the growing feeling is, look, if President Xi is going to sit down to 400 uh, government representatives as well as business leaders, this must mean something positive, that perhaps that there is going to be a chill in relations uh, between these, or rather a, a break in the chill in relations between these two countries and maybe uh, open up more avenues for business. Uh, also, we have to go back to these punishing punishing uh, taxes and, and tariffs that have been put on as well from both sides. Uh, for example, something that uh, a handful of years ago was taxed at about 3%, now in the U.S. is taxed at 19%, and in China it was taxed at 8%, now at 19%. So, of course, all business members would like to see this come down, and they would like to get into that massive middle class that China has to make more money. Elaine? All right, Sean Caleb's in our Washington newsroom. Thank you. As Sean mentioned, the world is facing several global challenges right now, the conflict in Ukraine, as well as the one between Israel and Hamas. Greg Emerson, a member of the Australian delegation, gave his take on whether those issues are pushing climate and economic concerns aside. As much attention is being paid to that and should be paid to it to seek a peaceful resolution in both cases, uh, it doesn't mean that everything else is off the agenda. So. 
I, I do think that um, with meetings such as the APEC meeting, uh, just think of 21 leaders uh, from around the, you know, the Asia Pacific region getting together uh, in a room. I had the honour of representing Australia in 2012 at the APEC leaders meeting at Vladivostok. Uh, when Julia Gillard's um, father sadly died and he had to go and she had to return to Australia. And there's just no substitute for people sitting around. And can I just add that some of the most useful discussions occur during coffee breaks, uh, where people are just, you know, you just walk up to some, a leader from another country and have a chat. So there are the very formal uh, meetings that occur on the sidelines of APEC, but lots of uh, informal discussions also occur. What, that is, ones that are not actually scheduled, but you're just um, all in the same room and have a chat with each other. Climate change is not the only area of cooperation between China and the U.S. Two countries produce more than 40 percent of the world's goods and services. And then although relations have been strained, they're still doing business together at record levels. Owen Fairclough has more. Ready. Harvesting crops in America's Midwest to meet China's growing appetite for commodities such as soybeans. After a record 2022, U.S. soybean exports had dropped off somewhat, partly due to competition from Brazil. But last week, China made its single biggest purchase of soybeans for three months. Good timing for U.S. officials visiting China's International Import Expo. China is a good market for U.S. agriculture products. It's our top market. We think it can be even better. We see great growth potential here. But there are unresolved trade tensions hanging over from former President Donald Trump. He imposed duties on hundreds of billions of dollars of Chinese imports after accusing Beijing of unfair trade practices. China retaliated with tariffs on a smaller scale before the two sides reached a deal for Beijing to import more U.S. goods to redress a trade imbalance, partly reflected in those agricultural exports. But under the Biden administration, diplomatic relations sank amid unresolved trade arguments before both sides reconciled, though Washington has maintained many of the Trump-era tariffs. Yet the U.S. government's own accountants have previously warned that these kinds of tariffs backfire by reducing household income. China has expressed its concern over U.S. sanctions against Chinese companies, two-way investment restrictions, export controls, and tariffs against Beijing, asking the U.S. to respond with concrete actions. Owen Fairclough, CGTN, Washington. For more on what's happening at APEC, Anthony Moretti joins us now. He's an associate professor in the Department of Communication and Organizational Leadership at Robert Morris University in Pennsylvania. He joins us now from Washington. Thanks for joining us. Professor, Professor, both China and the U.S. have released statements on their outcomes at this meeting, and there was some progress. So what are your impressions of what this hours-long summit produced outside of San Francisco? You know, I, two or three hours ago, if we had had this conversation at, say, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock Eastern time uh, in the U.S., I think the tone of it would have been somewhat optimistic, at least a cautious optimism. And what I mean by that is, you know, the, the, the word coming out of the White House was that there was going to be more military cooperation or, or communication again, and there was going to be some cooperation on trying to resolve the, the, the horrible uh, opioid and fentanyl crisis in the United States. Um, and then suddenly... It seems like something happened, or perhaps messages that were supposed to be positive perhaps got released a little too early. You know, we, we know for a, for a fact that the White House was talking about major progress and significant announcements today. Well, those two really don't qualify, at least in my mind, as significant announcements. And then we saw the statement released by uh, China regarding uh, 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 relating to, to to President Xi, and and it's clear that uh, whatever guardrails that are in place, he sees them as unfortunately still being in place. And until the U.S. tries to make some moves to to uh, to take those down, I don't know how much progress we're really going to see beyond maybe some cosmetic things that uh, at least allow for communication. Look, there wasn't. Uh any expectation, it seemed, ahead of this meeting. I mean, the fact that they were meeting face-to-face -face would be enough. And if you look at both, I read both um, 
releases. I mean, they did have a lot of the same language when it came to military communication, the cooperation on fentanyl, working together on climate change. I mean, for some, that would be uh, a success. So where do relations go from here? Uh, I, I'm concerned as to where they go from here. And again, what I mean by that is, you know, if, if you listened to the White House, it seemed as if they were ex expecting something significant, and then it didn't happen. And maybe one of the signs that uh, that, that maybe we should have been more aware of, of perhaps there being more conflict and more tension was when both, or rather when the White House said there would not be a joint statement issued by President Biden and President Xi. Instead, the two presidents and their two uh, and their representatives would issue their own statement. Typically, what we see in events like this is some sort of joint statement that says, we agree moving forward we want to get these things done the absence of such a statement i think should give us uh, uh, more concern than perhaps we had a couple hours ago because again if you listened only to what the white house said earlier this evening it sounded like there was at least some cautious optimism i'm not sure that exists now all right anthony moretti thank you so much for joining us uh, from washington dc we appreciate your insight and that does it for us here in Washington. Let's send it back to Lee Dongning in Beijing for more APEC coverage. Thank you very much, Elaine. And now let's uh, bring back our guests. We have uh, Zhao Hai in our studio, Director of International Political Studies at the National Institute for Global Strategy of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And of course, in Shanghai, we have uh, Professor Joseph Gregory Mahoney of Politics and International Relations at East China Normal University. Let's continue our discussions uh, since um, our Washington colleagues uh, have already uh, introduced the summit meeting between the two leaders then I want to know from both from you both that uh, I believe you have you have uh, read the readouts of the summit meeting and what stands out to you to each of you Professor Zhao first well I think there are uh, many uh, overlapping uh, areas between the two readouts uh, so even though without a uh, sort of joint statement coming out of two presidents. Uh, still, I think uh, the two sides have a lot of uh, common ground and agreed on uh, further uh, cooperation uh, from this meeting. Uh, one interesting thing stands out, uh, if you compare these two readouts, the Chinese put the guidance, the guiding principle of the bilateral relationship at the front, uh, and the U.S. side is actually putting that at the end of that uh, readout. So that means the Chinese side uh, wanted to emphasize uh, we need to have a common vision for the future and common principle to work on, uh, and the U.S. side uh, is more focused on pro perhaps domestic audience and wanted to put the, <clears throat> the so-called deliverables first. So uh, I think uh, if you look at the common understanding reached by two leaders, uh, they combined the two sides, uh, what they want to put in there. <clears throat> the Chinese side wanted to put uh, mutual respect, uh, peaceful coexistence, and win-win uh, cooperation, uh, the pr three principles, into uh, that readout, into the conversation. And the U.S. side wanted to say, uh, manage, you know, still maintain competition, uh, uh, also open up communication channels, manage uh, the bilateral relationship. Mm -hmm. And both sides agreed to uh, follow the UN Charter. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that is a good sign, which means that to at least have a common uh, principle guiding this re very complex relationship moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing is that uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, the good results coming out of this meeting, uh, of course, there are other additional communication channels uh, or uh, work, uh, joint working mechanisms being reestablished. Uh, that, that is supposed to be, I mean, that was cut off after the uh, Pelosi visit to Taiwan. Um, and this is a good sign that uh, two sides are restoring some of the uh, communication channels uh, that are lost. Mm -hmm. uh, and also combining with the previous high-level officials' visit and their, uh, uh, you know, uh, promoting of new communication channels uh, on economic issues, financial issues, on diplomatic uh, and military issues, combine those together, now we have a very uh, 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 complex, multi-level uh, sort of communication channels established. So that means to stabilize the relationship and to have a more productive results uh, in the future is to be expected. Right. And Professor Mahoney, do you, do you agree with uh, the interpretation of Professor Zhao's 
uh, about the readout of the uh, summit meeting. Uh, do you think the two countries are seeking a reset after a downward spiral relations between the two countries? You know, I, I don't think it's time to use the word reset. And, and I, I, you know, heard my colleague's comments from, from Washington. And, you know, he, he makes some valid points. But I think we need to put this in a, in a broader perspective, which is, you know, last year at the Bali meeting, we were hopeful that this year would produce a summit or a state visit. And that didn't happen. Instead, we were left uh, at, at the last minute or at the, at the end of the year with this meeting on the sidelines. And, and that was uh, in, and, in and of itself uh, a disappointment, but we were also greatly, greatly relieved after all the, the bad water under the bridge this past year that that would happen. So the fact that the meeting happened uh, at all was, was a very positive sign. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I would say that the way the meeting was held, the logistics, the way it was arranged, the way it was uh, 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 broadcast on both sides, it was like a summit. It was mm -hmm. as close as these two countries can get to a summit without actually having one or, or a state visit. So I think that that's uh, very positive. Uh, I think that uh, one of the things we have to go back to is um, the, the statement uh, that uh, we should not have expected very much to, to emerge, that this is going to take some time for some of these working groups to come together to reestablish communications, to reestablish mutual understanding. And we're also going to have to work through these difficult uh, election cycles, uh, which will create all sorts of opportunities, unfortunately, for new provocations that will need to be managed. So I think we are in a moment where we can make some progress. It remains to be seen, though, uh, how quickly that uh, will come along and whether it will come along at all. Uh, but again, I think this is one of the reasons why uh, President Xi is appealing directly to American business leaders, because he understands that the way the U.S. system works is that uh, the political system does respond substantially to, to business uh, concerns, to lobbying. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he wants to um, uh, bring that message uh, home to um, America's pocketbook, mm -hmm. uh, it, even if he can't uh, uh, make it so clear or, 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 or well understood by the White House or those in Congress. Right. So we'll continue our discussions later on. And now let's get back to my colleagues in San Francisco for their observations on the China-U.S. summit and also bilateral ties. Hello again, and, and, and Jim. Thank you so much. Well, the goodwill between China and the U.S. keeps building. Just hours before Presidents Xi and Biden met for lunch on Wednesday, Beijing and Washington reaffirmed their pledge to cooperate on many facets of their relationship, which has had a long and storied history. The first diplomatic breakthrough came during U.S. President Richard Nixon's 1972 visit to China to establish diplomatic relations. Shortly before that, though, the two countries engaged in so-called ping-pong diplomacy in 1971, which saw China invite members of the U.S. national ping-pong team for a friendly tournament in Beijing. But it wasn't just the ping-pong players bridging the divide. It was also the Philadelphia Orchestra. My colleague Tian Wei filed this report about that group of musicians, one of the first American cultural delegations to be sent to China following Nixon's visit. What about that part of the memory? What does that keep on giving you, you know, as a person in terms of an enriched life? Well, there's, of course, the, the memory of first, it was my first time taking a trip outside of the United States. And so to come to China was, was remarkable in itself. I mean, I had, of course, heard about China from school books and from geography and things and seeing it on TV. Mm -hmm. But I, I never dreamed that I would, would be able to come and see it, especially at such an early time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the experience of that and the people that I've met and making music with the people that I've met throughout the years has been incredibly important and one of the most satisfying things I have to say in my life. Mm -hmm. It's something that I experience almost every day. Right. And everywhere I go, one of the amazing things is that I run into people that were at those concerts 50 years ago. It just happened just a few weeks ago. We really? were, yes, literally, we were in North Carolina mm -hmm. in the United States and we had two concerts there. And in the middle of one, I got a notice that somebody wanted to talk to me. And I went to the stage door and here was this man and his wife and they told me we were in China in 1973 Weren't and they? saw those wow. concerts. So 
And it, it's amazing how frequently that happens and all over the world. So, you know, that, that uh, shows you, or shows me especially, the impact and the lasting impact of this experience of making music here in China in 1973. Mm -hmm. And it also makes you realize more and more, especially from as times go by, mm -hmm just how many people that reached and in so many different ways. David, you know, when you are in a country for the very first time, once ears, eyes and minds are all open, right? But once you are in a country for the 20 years and even the 30th time, um, how do you make sure that you can still discover new things? As an artist, you always want to discover new things, don't you? Oh, absolutely. And for one thing, it's easy to discover things here in China because you have so much uh, in, in things, art, uh, music. I love the nature of China. It's so beautiful. I love the plants of China. I've uh, discovered and, and even a couple of times that I've been here, I've managed to buy plants here in China and send them back. I have a greenhouse at home. Wow. So what, what, what about it when there was difficult times when people were saying, ah, China, 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 you know, um, what was it like for you? I think the most important thing that I can say about that is that I strongly, very firmly believe that, that music transcends problems, it transcends governments. It, it puts us in a place where, if nothing else, we can escape from that. Mm. Music can be a great escape, it can be a great healer and in an incredible way to, to deal with perhaps negative issues in our life. Right. Thank, thank you. you so much, David. Oh, thank you. So thank good you. to see you. Thank so you. good to see you. That report there from uh, Tianwei. Well, joining me now for more on China-U.S. relations are correspondents Jim Spellman and Hendrik Sebrandi. Great to have you here, guys. Um, Hendrik, let me start with you. It's been a long day. It's been a very eventful day. Take us through today. Yeah, it's uh, there's a lot to cover there. Mm -hmm. uh, the two leaders met at a giant estate about 40 kilometers south of San Francisco. Uh, this was an estate built by a family that made its fortune in the gold rush. So they were hoping, perhaps, to have some of that good fortune rub off on the two delegations when they met there uh, this morning. But they both arrived uh, shortly before 11 o'clock local time. Uh, President uh, Biden uh, was there to greet President Xi. They had the usual photo op in front of the, uh, the mansion there, or the, the building where they would be meeting. Then they went inside, sat along a long table. We've seen those tables many times in the past uh, with the two delegations on either side. The two uh, leaders addressed each other in, in short, prepared remarks. Uh, President Biden said uh, to host you in the U.S. is a great honor and pleasure. He said we have to ensure that the competition does not veer into conflict. And that seemed to be the, the overall tenor is that the two sides were trying to find some way to address a myriad of issues, figure out a way to kind of find some common ground to try to keep things from getting too far off track as they have in some cases over the past couple of years. We keep hearing about guardrails, yeah. how important those are, and I think the two countries are taking a more active uh, effort to try to put those guardrails in place in various different areas and try to build some positive momentum. It may say, take some time, but I think today may have been a good start. Jim, as Hendrick says, these two leaders had to address a myriad mm -hmm. issues here. Yeah, it ranged from trade issues all the way through health issues, women's empowerment, things like that. Um, what are some of the things that they would talk about? We understand that concrete progress was made uh, on a couple of key issues. We've gotten readouts from both the Chinese side and the U.S. side. On, on fentanyl, the U.S. has been concerned about precursor chemicals making their way uh, into the West, turned into illegal drugs, fentanyl, et cetera coming into the U.S. The two sides have agreed to take on counter-narcotics. They'll be working on uh, establishing a channel to do that. Military to military communications. There's been no formal military to military communications in more than a year. This was a high priority for the White House going into these talks. They have agreed to work on a mechanism for military to military communication on three levels. The minister level, the uh, senior military commander level, and then especially the boat captain level, which is really key to making sure that there aren't misunderstandings yeah. that lead to, to, to real accidents. Uh, on the thorny issue of Taiwan and acknowledgement that this is perhaps the biggest challenge between the two countries, 
President Biden did acknowledge uh, the U.S. adherence to the uh, one China policy. That's always something uh, welcome to hear in, in Beijing. Yeah. Hendrik, one other issue that there is some agreement on, <coughs> in fact, not some, a lot of agreement on, is climate change, isn't it? There is, although it was interesting that after the meeting, uh, President Biden had a press conference this afternoon and didn't actually bring up climate change, which was kind of interesting, even though this was something that they both uh, heralded, uh, you know, a, a day before these meetings. But in fact, the two sides did reach an agreement where they both committed to ramping up uh, renewable energy much more than they have in the past. They've set 2030 as a target year for achieving some uh, major progress in that area, trying to bring down fossil fuels. Uh, these are the two, the world's two largest polluters. Mm -hmm. Uh, and have been for quite some time. So uh, clearly they need to take the lead, if anybody is, in reaching some of these climate goals. And, and this was something that they announced even prior to uh, the meeting that took place today. Again, it's interesting that President Biden, of course he had a lot of things to talk about in the press conference this afternoon. This was not something he highlighted, but I think it is, and especially for a lot of these APEC economies, the 21 member economies here, this is something they are going to value, uh, seeing the two uh, leading polluters yeah. take a, a major uh, proactive approach here. Jim, big focus uh, on business, uh, right? Well, there's several events taking place mm -hmm. as we speak in this city tonight. Very glittering events, very expensive mm -hmm. events to attend. What can you tell us about yeah, that? Yes, so during the day they had what's called the CEO Summit. This was a chance for the business community and these world leaders to mingle, perhaps to do some business. As we speak right now, there's a dinner being held with the Chinese President Xi Jinping and business leaders, specifically tech business leaders. And uh, this is really a, a, an important opportunity for these businesses to get some one-on-one -on -one face time with President Xi Jinping. The bottom line is, this is a huge market. These companies want to do business there. They see obstacles to that, largely from the friction in the U.S.-China relationship. So they want to get in there make their pitch and perhaps be part of changing the tone of this relationship so it can become a little bit more business friendly. Yeah, and if I could just interject yeah. real quick, mm -hmm. uh, China is very eager to get that investment as well. Their economy has had some challenges, as has the U.S. economy. Um, I spoke with the financial uh, secretary of Hong Kong last night in a separate interview. He's also very eager to try to attract mm -hmm. U.S. investment, get companies into into that area as well. So this is a you know, there's a lot of deal making that they hope to do here at this particular event, and that's a, a high priority for, for all concerned. Jim, very quickly, I've only got about 20 seconds. Uh, you've been following what the governor of California, Gavin mm -hmm. Newsom, has been saying. He says uh, very clearly, these two countries are not going to get divorced. It's impossible. They have to work together. And he said that while he was looking at a new Boeing electric plane prototype that China would love to see flying over their skies and Boeing would love to sell them to them. That's the kind of relationship the business community sees and they see that being the beginning to a better overall geopolitical relationship between the two countries. Okay, Jim Spellman, Hendrik Saberandi, thank you so much. And that is it from us. Back to you in Beijing. All right, thank you very much, Anna. This was a fantastic uh, discussion over there. Our reporter, Dan Williams, is joining us from uh, San Francisco with more details on reception and dinner honoring President Xi Jinping. And uh, as we just know, as we're, we already know that uh, the uh, dinner has already started, officially started. This reception to welcome Chinese President Xi Jinping has begun with the US-based executives from uh, sectors including banking and technology in attendance. Uh, and Dan Williams is uh, going to give us some more details about this dinner later on. Now let's uh, continue our discussions with uh, our two guests, Professor Zhao and Professor Mahoney. Uh, well, we talked a lot about uh, the bilateral meetings, uh, is the, the summit meetings between President Xi Jinping and uh, President Joe Biden. Uh, but while they are sending some positive signals uh, of uh, bilateral ties, actually the whole world is listening, especially uh, the other APEC member countries that are having meetings in San Francisco as well. What signals do you think the summit meeting between the two leaders send out to them, uh, Professor Zhao? 
Well, I think clearly the U.S. is, uh, I mean, both China and U.S. are sending a, a very strong signal uh, to the world and particularly to the region that the two uh, uh, nations wanted to have a stable uh, relationship uh, and also having uh, this very strong will to improve relations in the, in the near future. And I think uh, many uh, the countries in the region get the signal. Uh, look at the relations between China and Australia. Recently, there's a, a very significant improvement uh, between the two sides. And also, uh, China and Japan relations has a uh, sort of a new high-level dialogue happen uh, also recently. Uh, there probably will have more uh, China-Korea-Japan talks in the future. Uh, and also, China's relations with uh, Southeast Asia countries are um, uh, consolidated. And recently, there are joint uh, military exercises uh, uh, under uh, having Having this uh, more improved uh, trust and confidence between the two sides. So overall, I think a better relationship between the two largest countries in the world have a very uh, positive uh, effect in the region, uh, not only from a security perspective, but also from a trade perspective. You, you will see that th that will help the recovery of all the uh, countries from the post-pandemic uh, uh, economic problems and challenges. Uh, and that's what we recently uh, talked about. Uh, there are challenges within China, and also uh, the U.S. moving forward has also uh, kind of problems with uh, extra debts and also their budget problems. So working together is a necessity for mm -hmm. both countries and for the region. And with this signal, I think uh, in, the, in the coming years, you will see more countries are willing to uh, extend uh, cooperative relations uh, and also trying to uh, have more talks and discussions about more free trade uh, among themselves. Right. Uh Work together. Cooperation, of course, are the key messages sent out from the summit meeting. But uh, it's not very easy to do that. We're going to discuss what kind of feasible steps can be taken to accomplish just that. But before the discussion, let's uh, cross over to my colleague, Dan Williams, who is joining us from San Francisco with more details on the reception and dinner honoring President Xi Jinping that is happening right now. So, Dan, what do you have for us? Yeah, as you say, this welcome dinner taking place right now, and it is one of the hottest tickets in town, it has to be said. Uh, this is an opportunity for some of the business leaders uh, to really have their uh, potential time with uh, Xi Jinping, the, the Chinese president. Uh, uh, we know that the likes of Tim Cook, the Apple CEO, are, an are in attendance. Uh, Elon Musk, the uh, uh, Tesla and uh, ex-CEO, also scheduled to attend. But also there will be uh, some other uh, perhaps familiar faces to Xi Jinping as well, uh, the likes of Terry Branstad, uh, the former Iowa governor, and also the former U.S. Uh, uh, ambassador to uh, China as well. He is in attendance there. He's considered to be one of the old friends, of course, uh, uh, from Iowa, where Xi Jinping back in 1985 uh, traveled to Iowa, the U.S. state of Iowa, uh, then as a uh, county level official to uh, uh, have uh, an experience there to, uh, to talk uh, and to experience agriculture uh, uh, for his own, uh, through his own eyes at that time as well. And, and of course, back then, 2012, a few years later, he returned to Iowa uh, as well to see some of those old friends, some of those people uh, that helped him have that experience of US life back in 1985. Some of those people, some of those old friends uh, expected to be in attendance at this welcome dinner as well. And uh, in fact, I was with one of those uh, people when they arrived into San Francisco last night, Sarah Landy, uh, who helped uh, guide Xi Jinping back around uh, in uh, 1985. Uh, and she said that it's important for her uh, that she now uh, gets to see some of these people-to-people uh, -people exchanges, uh, some of those exchanges to be returning. She says it's the only way uh, countries and people uh, can learn to understand each other, to learn about each other's cultures uh, and to respect each other and to share ideas and that's what she hopes uh, really comes from this uh, this week-long uh, APEC meeting here uh, in San Francisco. Thank you very much indeed Dan. Dan Williams reporting from San Francisco about the uh, dinner honoring President uh, Xi Jinping and the number of uh, commercial aircraft flights between China and the United States is increasing and is set to reach 70 per week. The increase follows Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi's visit to Washington and comes ahead of the APEC meeting in San Francisco. John Terrett reports. I'm at one of New York's busy airports to try out the latest app on my phone. 
A friend of mine is on their way to China. I've just dropped them off. And I can track their progress with this amazing app on my cell phone. It shows me the flight number, the aircraft type, the height, the speed, the location, all the way to Shanghai. I can't show you their flight because it hasn't taken off yet, but here's one recorded earlier heading to Shanghai. The number of direct flights between the US and China is soon expected to increase from 48 to 70 per week, still well below the numbers before COVID-19 struck. For the longest time, the countries have been getting at each other. And now we see this little step in the right direction. It, it can only be a good sign. And hopefully this leads to better results and maybe better trade, better communication between the two countries. According to the travel app Flightmaster, there were around 300 flights a week between the U.S. and China in 2019. The increase from 48 to 70 follows Foreign Minister Wang Yi's visit to Washington last month and comes ahead of the APEC meeting in San Francisco. The hope is the increase in flights will bring seat prices down too. There's going to be a strong demand, so prices are going to remain high for a little while. But as we normalize, as things get back to that normal and they increase the amount of flights, I would expect to see prices drop. Airlines that are likely to benefit from the new higher limits include Air China, China Eastern, and the big three in the U.S., United, Delta, and America. It's good for the country's economies, trade, and personnel visits, but perhaps most important of all, more chances for families to be reunited. And how is my friend getting on? Well, according to this app, the plane is at 30,000 feet north of New York, heading for the border with Canada and well on the way to Shanghai. And by the time you see this, they'll be there. John Terrett, CGTN, New York. All right, now let's continue our discussions with Professor Zhao Hai and uh, Professor Joseph Greg Gregory Mahoney. Uh, Professor Zhao, as we heard from uh, my colleague Ken Wei's uh, interview with the musician from Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra, that he, he said Mus music transcends problems. What others can transcend problems, Professor? Well, other than music, you have sports. I think Chinese people love uh, NBA, and NBA is a very uh, major uh, sort of uh, 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 communication channels between the two sides. And now in China, we have CBA, and also we have CUNBA. And uh, American <laughs> people, uh, through TikTok, are looking at this and uh, shows interest. So I think in the, in the future, there are many areas uh, uh, other than uh, music, sports. There are also cultural aspects. Americans love Chinese food, as far as we know, and the Chinese also love to travel to the United States. Tourism is going to be at the center uh, t uh, next year uh, with the return of flights. So I think there are many, many ways to uh, increase the people-to-people -people exchanges and increase uh, uh, people's friendly, uh, friendly relationship uh, and their mutual understanding. Right. And Professor Mahoney, how do you see the uh, resumption of the uh, flight between the two countries, flight routes between the two countries? Do you see as a start or how significant is that? Clearly, it's a start. Uh, uh, unfortunately, it's a, it's a long overdue. These are COVID related restrictions that should have been lifted uh, months ago, uh, but were held in place for, for really kind of silly reasons. Um, I, I, I think it is right uh, to to believe that uh, as more flights are added, even though the, the current number of 70 will, will bring us still to less than a third of what they were before the pandemic, uh, that this will help bring prices down and that will encourage more travel. Uh, I think the bigger concern, though, as, as was noted earlier in the broadcast, is that uh, the number of uh, Chinese students going to the United States, the number of tourists going to, to both sides, is much lower than before, and that we'll need to do more than simply lowering uh, the price of air travel or, or providing uh, more seats. We'll actually need to uh, uh, prompt people in various ways to uh, uh, once again um, uh, see each other as, as human beings on a shared planet with a, with the, the, the inevitability of a, of a shared future, mm -hmm. and that uh, and, and support this in, in other in, in whatever way possible with policy supports, uh, scholarships. Um, more events like bringing uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra back uh, to Beijing. These are all things that, that rehumanize the relationship and I think uh, give people confidence. Uh, I think we need to see uh, the United States uh, dropping uh, travel warnings. Uh, we've seen uh, the U.S. Uh, putting travel warnings, uh, warning Americans not to go to China. All of this is kind of silly. China is, in fact, a much safer place to visit than the United States is. Um, 
The other thing is I'm a little concerned that, that the Chinese are, are a little more uh, uh, level-headed when it comes to the United States, um, that, uh, that we may see more Chinese uh, being willing to, to travel uh, to the U.S. I, I know that, you know, that there are more, a lot more Chinese people than American people, but nevertheless, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I hope that these flights are not just full of Chinese people <laughs> coming and going, but they also include right. uh, Americans who are, who are coming and, and uh, learning more about China and reestablishing a positive relationship. Exactly. And when talking about people-to-people uh, -people exchange, uh, President Xi Jinping also said the future of China-U.S. relations lies in the youth. Uh, so, Professor Mahoney, do you think the younger generation from both sides now have a better understanding of each other than those who came before or long before? You know, I have two kids, one who's 19 and, and another who's 15. They're both American kids. I raised them here in Shanghai. They both study here in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. uh, I teach uh, both international and Chinese students. That they do not speak Shanghainese, but they can understand it and right. speak a bit. But, but uh, they're, they're, they're fully bilingual. They're fully bilingual in both languages. But, you know, I teach both international students and Chinese students at the university. Uh, I was stuck with my kids in the U.S. for two years during the pandemic. But it's been my assessment uh, for many years that uh, Chinese and American youth have more in common with each other in many cases than they do with their own parents or grandparents. So I'm actually rather optimistic that their relations can be positive in the future. Uh, my only concern is whether, you know, what the kids call the old heads, uh, uh, including the old ways of thinking, especially Cold War ways of thinking or carbon heavy. So when you say so old, on. you mean conservative. Is that a, one of the trends in the U.S.? <laughs> Well, it's you know I'm 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 being kind of uh, silly because old head is actually a, a term from uh, uh, rap songs of people who who were rapping and, and talking about things in the mm -hmm. 80s and 90s. But nevertheless, it's a term, or, or I hope it's a term that I'm not showing uh, my my lack of sophistication. It means people who who uh, think in old ways and and aren't hip to uh, the new digital trends, new digital culture, and new ways of thinking. Uh, about a, a broad range of, of social behaviors and, and, and values that young people are hip to, but, but old people are perhaps more stuck in the past. So I think that, you know, as, as long as we can avoid um, uh, old heads, and, and I'm not pointing the finger at the octogenarians vying for power in uh, Washington, um, then, um, uh, you know, and if we can avoid destroying the world um, or are leading, uh, uh, are, are these people leading us into some sort of devastating conflict before the young people uh, fully inherit the world? I'm very, very optimistic um, that, uh, that uh, the future will be bright uh, for the young people, not just my children, but the young people of both countries. But uh, we need to try to make sure that, uh, that we don't wreck things entirely or that we don't leave a, a sweltering world of, of, um, of uh, unremitting climate change uh, for them to uh, struggle with uh, for the rest of their lives. Indeed. And Professor Zhao, China has actually just uh, hosted the, the fifth China-U.S. Sister Cities Conference. Uh, 284 pairs of sister cities have been formed since the first pair was set in 1979. That was kind of out of my expectation. I didn't expect to see that big number uh, as a big sister cities between the two countries. Then how can localized mechanisms effectively promote civil society engagement other than high level exchanges? Well, uh, before I answer this question, I wanted to uh, add some statistic, statistic support to Professor Mahoney's argument that uh, actually if you look at the, the polls in the, in the United States, young people uh, and the old, older uh, aged people has a significant gap in viewing uh, China uh, negatively or positively because the older people have uh, a, a more negative view of China and young people apparently uh, have more uh, like positive view of China and because I think they are more familiar with uh, uh, modern social media platform and through TikTok and other kinds of international uh, uh, social media platform they will see a real China uh, that is not interfered by uh, mainstream media in the West that has apparently a, a very a biased view of China. So I think uh, direct communication is very important because then uh, you won't be uh, misrepresented or being misinformed. And I think that's very important. And on sister cities, uh, I think there are 
uh, many, many areas uh, that on a local level both can learn from their best practices, uh, including uh, how to combat climate change, how to manage the cities safely, how to improve uh, and how to get uh, smart city plans to actually improve uh, civil services. Uh, and also many, many other areas like uh, city urban planning, uh, 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 transportation, uh, health care, uh, all aspects of local uh, uh, cities communicating with each other and including the cultural exchanges we mentioned before. So I think uh, on the local level there are many, many things they can do uh, uh, communicating with each other and also with the increased flight, hopefully those kind of pre previously existing uh, sisterhood uh, between the cities, between the two countries can be reestablished and their uh, delegations can come back and forth and bring the experiences, uh, good experience of both sides to the other and help their both peoples to improve their livelihood. Indeed, and uh, the people-to-people -people exchanges actually uh, are increasing in recent in in last year. Uh, we we've, we've seen uh, the uh, Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra visiting uh, after so many years, and also we've seen recently a uh, veteran airman of the American volunteer group nicknamed the Flying Tigers was returned to China. Uh, some, some of the flying tigers, some of the tigers are over 100 years old and fought against fascism in China during World War II. This is the common cause at the time. So looking forward, what, what could be the next common cause to unite China and the US? This is a question for both of, us, uh, for both of you, Professor Mahoney first. Well, you know, it, with, with uh, respect to the orchestra's visit, uh, I'd like to recall here the special role that music plays in Chinese traditional thinking, uh, particularly as it relates to the concept of harmony. Uh, we know that Confucius was asked uh, long ago by one of his follow followers that mm -hmm. if a student has only enough time and resources to study a single classic, in other words, one of the classic books that were considered essential to learning, then which should he choose? And Confucius responded by naming uh, the Book of Songs, mm. uh, saying that at least uh, with this book, the student could learn harmony and that this was uh, more important than anything else. Now, perhaps it's a bit romantic uh, to connect Confucius's advice to present circumstances, but we do know that the concept of harmony remains an important trope uh, for Beijing. It certainly features heavily in Chinese foreign policy discourse, and I'd like to think that the orchestra's visit should be understood in this cultural context. Now, to, to directly answer your question uh, about what the future may hold, let, let's hope that it holds addressing uh, climate change and, and pursuing peace uh, it, together in Ukraine and Gaza, as well as uh, preventing uh, conflicts uh, elsewhere. Uh, whether we do this under the auspices of the Global Security Initiative or not, uh, let's hope uh, it uh, is committed to nuclear nonproliferation and better controls for AI. Let's hope it's working uh, together to advance uh, responsible development of the global south, not working against each other, as, as we've seen uh, the U.S. trying to um, uh, attack and, and compete with uh, the Belt Road Initiative, that we see both countries confronting global debt issues, uh, working together to, to reform uh, multilateral organizations to make them more efficient, uh, equitable, and democratic. And let's hope, uh, uh, above all, uh, in, in the near term, that they can uh, restore uh, healthy bilateral trade uh, to reinforce all of these positive ties and ensure uh, mutual growth uh, going forward. Yeah, what about you, Professor Zhao? Do you see a common cause existing at all? Well, it's interesting. Recently, I visited D.C. and a U.S. expert told me that uh, even the aliens evade the Earth, uh, China and the U.S. <laughs> cannot work together. We all laughed, uh, but I disagree with him. Uh, I think he's uh, saying this because he's disappointed that even during the pandemic, a common threat, uh, China and the U.S. are not working properly uh, with each other and lead the world. Um, but I think uh, there are larger challenges to humanity, and uh, we're facing this. As Professor Mahoney mentioned, there are common security challenges, but, th th those, but other uh, than that, there's uh, climate change. Uh, just like for, uh, alien invasion, we have nowhere to hide. We share the same Earth. <laughs> Uh, and also there are um, other areas that uh, we need to cooperate with each other, uh, uh, such as AI uh, threats that uh, may emerge in the future with a very quick development of AI capability. So I think on many of the issues, uh, China and uh, U.S. interests overlap, and it's very important, critically important, that two countries work together to lead uh, uh, the world 
to come up with a common framework uh, or a common mechanism to solve our common challenges and problems. And on that, I think uh, that should be a priority above the geopolitical differences. And that's, that is critically important, and that's what President Xi is trying to convey the message to the U.S. side. Right. At the moment, we, uh, I, at least I don't see any uh, necessity of uh, introducing the third power of uh, aliens or the three-bodied beings to unite China and U.S., the first and the second largest economies. But we do need to see a lot of efforts to be put in uh, bilateral ties. Uh, then, actually, the summit meeting between the two leaders sent out a message that uh, there is not an option to not engage with each other. There is not in, uh, an option for each other to be hostile, to have a conflict uh, between the two sides. Then what is the option? What should uh, both sides and uh, enlarge the world do to be united, uh, Professor Zhao? Well, I always repeat uh, what uh, the uh, game theory told us, uh, which is that in a long, infinite game, uh, either side cannot eliminate the other side, and they uh, continue to be uh, the two players in the game. The only result is cooperation. Uh, and I think right now we're going through this stage to find, trying to find a new normal or new equilibrium between the two sides. Uh, but the outcome will be only one, just like President Xi said. You know, there are a thousand reasons to, for the two sides to have a good relationship, and that is theoretically right, because mm -hmm. ultimately we have to cooperate with each other uh, if we uh, want the world mm -hmm. uh, to work, work uh, as we wished and uh, if we continue to improve our uh, welfare. Uh, together, so I think there's no other option, and that's very obvious. Right, and President Xi also said that each side's success is actually an opportunity for the other side. How should we understand this concept? Uh, do you think that both success of uh, the two powers can coexist, Professor Mahoney? Well, you know, I, I agree with uh, everything that Professor Zhao just said, and I agree with what President Xi says. My, my fundamental concern, looking at this from a, a, a realistic uh, geostrategic perspective, is that uh, the U.S. economy uh, depends substantially on maintaining the hegemony of the U.S. dollar, and that uh, requires maintaining uh, other forms of hegemony. And my concern is that uh, U.S. hegemony is, is something that uh, China uh, refuses to live under. In other words, China isn't looking to be a hegemon itself. It's not looking to control the world, uh, but it's not going to uh, uh, chafe under U.S. controls or, or even uh, the possibility that the U.S. can threaten uh, the, U uh, the Chinese financial system or the Chinese economy. Uh, it will find solutions and that, that will allow it to continue to grow forward and to, to, to complete its uh, modernization drive. So my, my first concern is that, that, that there, is this, there is this hegemonic aspect or, or central characteristic of the U.S. economy that, that depends above all on the dollar's hegemony. And I, I haven't yet seen a clear solution to that. We do see that um, uh, some um, uh, uh, countries are moving away from the dollar, but, uh, you know, still that's going to take time. Uh, and I'm also concerned that the U.S. is playing uh, possibly uh, a strategic end game with climate change. But I, I do fundamentally believe that every time the U.S. has tried to contain China or restrict China's development, it has failed. And I think these efforts will fail. And I think sooner or later the U.S. will wake up to that and wake up to the fact that its paradigm cannot continue or the containment policy can't continue. And it will have to take China on equal terms and it will have to move forward. Now, whether that's happening now or whether it happens uh, years from now, it, it comes sooner or later. Right. We'll continue our discussions later on. Now, President Xi Jinping has proposed uh, five pillars to ease strained relations, restore trust and respect, and push cooperation between China and the U.S. for the good of the world. And she made the remarks during a summit on Wednesday with uh, U.S. President Joe Biden in San Francisco, California. Uh, Lu Wei tells us more. President Xi Jinping and his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden met for a summit during Xi's first trip to the United States in six years. It is their first meeting in a year since they last met on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Bali. In opening remarks, President Xi underscored his long-standing view that cooperation between the world's two largest economies will benefit both their peoples and the rest of the world. 
He said China-U.S. relations should be perceived in the broad context of global transformations unseen in a century, and pointed out that major country competition cannot solve the problems facing the two nations or the world. President Xi said the world is big enough for the two countries to succeed. My view is consistent, which is that major country competition is not a prevailing trend of current times and cannot solve the problems facing China and the United States or the world at large. Planet Earth is big enough for the two countries to succeed, and one country's success is an opportunity for the other. During their talks. President Xi explained Chinese modernization and its significance. President Xi made it clear that China does not have a plan to unseat the United States, but the Chinese president said the U.S. should not scheme to suppress and contain China. He said that despite differences in culture and social systems, mutual respect could pave the way for more promising relations. It is an objective fact that China and the United States are different in history, culture, social system, and development path. However, as long as we respect each other, coexist in peace, and pursue win-win cooperation, we will be fully capable of rising above differences and find the right way for the two major countries to get along with each other. I firmly believe in the promising future of the bilateral relationship. President Xi pointed out that mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and win-win cooperation are the lessons learned from 50 years of China-U.S. relations and from geopolitical conflicts in history. He called on China and the U.S. to exert more effort in putting these lessons into practice. The Chinese president proposed building together five pillars for better bilateral ties. First, developing a right perception of each other, so the two countries can coexist in mutual respect and peace. Second, managing disagreements and untoward incidents effectively through calm, frequent communication. Third, advancing mutually beneficial cooperation, not just in traditional areas like trade, but in emerging and urgent issues such as climate change and artificial intelligence. Fourth. Shouldering responsibilities as major countries by stepping up coordination and cooperation on international and regional issues. Fifth, promoting people-to-people -people exchanges. President Xi Jinping also reaffirmed China's position on the Taiwan question. He told the U.S. to stop arming Taiwan and support China's peaceful reunification, stressing that China's reunification with the Taiwan region is unstoppable. On trade, he urged the U.S. to lift export controls and unilateral sanctions on Chinese economic entities, saying these actions hurt China's legitimate interests. President Xi said technological innovation is a driver of China's high-quality development. Attempts to stifle the country's technological growth are moves to contain the progress of China and its people. For his part. President Biden said it was important to keep the two countries' competition in check, and called for joint efforts to tackle common challenges. We have to ensure that competition does not veer into conflict, and we also have to manage it responsibly. That competition—that's what the United States wants, and what we intend to do. We also—I also believe it's a world wants for both of us. Candid exchange. We also have a responsibility to our people. And the work in the world to work together when we see it in our interest to do so. The U.S. president said a stable and developing China serves the interests of the U.S. and the world. President Biden reaffirmed his own five points. The U.S. does not seek a new Cold War or to change the Chinese system. It does not seek to strengthen alliances against China. The U.S. does not support Taiwan independence. And has no intention of conflict with China. Presidents Xi and Biden acknowledge China-U.S. ties as the most important bilateral relationship in the world. They called on all countries to treat each other with respect, find a way to coexist peacefully, and maintain open lines of communication.
They stressed the importance of preventing conflict, upholding the UN Charter, cooperating on areas of shared interest, and managing competitive aspects of the relationship. The two presidents agreed to promote dialogue and cooperation on emerging issues such as artificial intelligence and to resume high-level military-to-military communication on the basis of equality and respect. They agreed to further increase passenger flights between the U.S. and China early next year and expand educational, student, youth, cultural, sports and business exchanges. The two leaders will accelerate joint efforts to tackle the climate crisis in this critical decade. After the summit, President Biden hosted a lunch for President Xi, where the two leaders' discussions on international issues included the Israel-Palestine conflict. They also took a walk at Falali Estate and agreed to maintain regular contact. And leaders from 21 economies in the Asia-Pacific region are gathering for the APEC economic cooperation meetings in San Francisco. And for more on that, let's go to uh, Mark New again in uh, Palo Alto, California. Mark, hello there. So what are the highlights from the past few days and what can we expect from the remaining gatherings? Well, that's right. I mean, there were other things outside of the uh, bilateral meeting between she and Biden, some other things did happen, namely the CEO summit. Um, that event got into full swing today with numerous dialogues on the agenda or the attendance uh, expected to be tech CEOs like Elon Musk, um, uh, Microsoft Satya Nadella, uh, Google CEO Sundar Pichai and OpenAI's Sam Altman, of course the uh, maker or creator of ChatGPT, uh, Salesforce's Mark Benioff, I like to say, uh, that by being in San Francisco, you have access, uh, APEC being there, you have access to all this, uh, you know, these pioneers of innovation. So uh, an advantage of being in this city. Now, presidents and prime ministers from member economies attend the event, um, including those from Vietnam, Chile, Thailand, and the Republic of Korea. Business deals are undoubtedly happening, but perhaps the guiding theme turned out to be sustainability. Uh, and what opportunities companies and industry can play in helping member economies reach those green goals. Also, California's Governor Gavin Newsom was attending the uh, CEO summit. Um, CGTN actually caught up with him. He was actually the first um, American uh, to greet uh, President Xi as he deplaned in San Francisco. Now, Newsom. Uh, stress the role of climate change, especially noting that China and the U.S. are contributing to 40 percent of the global emissions and that therefore a divorce, in his words, is not an option. And indeed, ahead of the Xi-Biden uh, meeting, China and the U.S. did announce uh, an agreement to resume a working group on climate cooperation and pledged a major ramp up of renewable, renewable energy. And the importance of sustainability could also be seen in other events like the, uh, with U.S. Special Representative for Climate John Kerry uh, presiding over the APEC Business Advisory Council Sustainable Future Forum. In another event, U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai opened the APEC ministerial meeting uh, session on indigenous peoples' perspective on regional trade. Both of these events focus on uh, creating equal representation, another big theme happening throughout this week's APEC. Back right, to you thank the you. Thank you very much, Mark. New reporting from uh, California in the U.S. And uh, that's all for the uh, our special coverage on reception and dinner honoring President Xi Jinping and Li Dongning in Beijing. And stay with me for more latest updates on the President uh, Xi's trip to San Francisco.